Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am most grateful to Indiana University and the university that I serve, Presidency University, Kolkata, for the travel grants that they gave me. I am also most grateful to Professor Elvin Rosenfeld in particular and to the Academic Advisory Committee for giving me this opportunity to present before you. I shall be speaking on Holocaust inversion and the anti-Israel sentiment in the English language press in South Asia. Although more than 80% of the population in India, the second most populous country in the world is Hindu, yet when it comes to Holocaust inversion and calls for a boycott of Israel, it is the Muslim right and not the Hindu which is at the forefront. Equally vehement in its opposition to Israel is the left in South Asia. Equating Israel with Nazi Germany is as common in the Urdu press as in the leftist press. And Urdu is the lingua franca of South Asian Muslims, if not the first language of all. As far as the leftist press is concerned, it is managed by Muslims as well as non-Muslims, irrespective of language. This paper limits its study to the English language press in South Asia. What I imply by South Asia are the SARC member countries, where four countries, India, Maldives, Nepal and Sri Lanka, maintain diplomatic relations with Israel. The only non-Muslim country in the region that does not have relations with Israel as yet is Bhutan while the only Muslim country in the region to have diplomatic relations with Israel is Maldives. The rest of all the countries in the region are predominantly Muslim and do not have any relations with Israel, with Afghanistan, Bangladesh and Pakistan. The paper seeks to present an overview of how Israelis and Jews are often equated with Nazis by the English language press in South Asia. It also seeks to understand how effective or ineffective has been the response of the embassies of Israel in, in India and Nepal, the only two Israeli embassies in South Asia, and how successful or unsuccessful have been the Jewish advocacy organizations active in the region in countering this negative projection. An article titled Britain Marks 30 Years of Rushdie Fatwa that appeared in the English language daily newspaper The Telegraph on February 14, 2019 reported how the CEO of Penguin in London, Peter Meyer, ignored the advice of the consultant in India, Khushwant Singh, to cancel the publication of the Satanic Verses. What is interesting is that the article's author Amit Roy felt the need to mention parenthetically that Peter Meyer was Jewish, as if it had something to do with, the, with his decision to ignore the advice against the publication of the Satanic Verses. Roy does not mention the religious affiliation of any of the dozen other people from different religious backgrounds mentioned in the article, except Kalim Siddiqui a British Muslim leader who was consulted by an Iranian minister on behalf of Khomeini before he declared the infamous fatwa against Rushdie. <clears throat> Established in 1982, The Telegraph is the fifth most widely read English language daily newspaper in India, according to the Indian Readership Survey 2014. Its circulation was estimated to stand at 466,001 copies in 2016. It is hardcore leftist in its orientation. The above mentioned article is just one little example of the most subtle attempts to portray Jews negatively in the Indian press, where there is no scarcity of explicit and blatant attempts at doing so, particularly with regard to Zionists and Israelis, if not Jews in general. But before we look 
at the driven examples of anti-Zionism or anti-Semitism from the Indian press and the South Asian press in general. It is important to realize the importance of South Asia as a region and to get an idea of the huge size of its press. South Asia is home to 21% of the global population, irrespective of religion and one-third of the world's Muslim population. India, the region's largest and most populous country. India, the region's largest and most populous country, home to one-sixth of the global population, has 82,000 237 newspapers and news magazines, after which 12,000 are daily newspapers, with 1,406 out of these in the English language, over 397 television news channels, and 462 million internet users. 39% of 1.2 million Indians read newspapers. Newspapers sell 125 million copies every day in India. According to the World Association of Newspapers, one in every five daily newspapers in the world is published in India. In 2015, the newspaper industry in India grew by 8%. In India, print publications attract 43% of all corporate advertising, while in the United States the figure is less than 15%. India is the world's largest English, is the world's second largest English speaking country. It is estimated that around 10% of its population, or 125 million people, speak English, which is second only to the United States. The number is expected to quadruple in the next decade. <coughs> there are altogether 12 major media houses in India which control most of its print and online publications in radio and television channels. Their owners generally have some political affiliation or the other at any given point of time. India's most prominent left-wing newspaper is the Hindu. Its founder, N. Ram, chairman of Kasturi and Sons Limited, as a student was an active member, in fact, vice president of Students' Federation of India, the student wing of the Communist Party of India, Marxist. In 2018, it published a commentary by Mohammad Ayub, senior fellow, Center for Public Policy, Washington, D.C., and University Distinguished Professor Emeritus of International Relations, Michigan State University, on the legislation of the Jewish homeland law in Israel. In his op-ed, Ayub almost equated the state of Israel with the Islamic State. He wrote, quote, This law makes Israel the mirror image of the concept of the Islamic Caliphate which was expected to embrace all Muslims and to which all Muslims, no matter where they lived, were expected to be loyal. Now, most of the Muslim world, except for outliers like the Islamic State and the Hizb ul tahrir have given up this goal and adjusted to the nation-state system based on the territorial principle. In an article, titled The Nazis Are in Gaza, that appeared in the newspaper Hill Post in 2014. Retired Indian bureaucrat Ajay Shukla wrote, quote, It is a crucial irony of history that the Jewish government in Israel, uh, it, is a cruel, it is a cruel irony of history that the Jewish government in Israel is doing to the Muslim residents of Gaza exactly what the Nazis did to them 70 years ago. It is now the face of a reinvented Nazism, an oppressor of the weak and helpless. One major commonality in the two 
more examples of the vilification of the state of Israel that I shall be giving to, to you now is that the author in both cases is aware of his Jewish lineage and feels that his admission of it makes his argument or arguments more compelling. He is also conscious of the prominent position he enjoys in the Indian civil society. One of India's best known novelists, playwrights, film and drama critics and screenwriters, Kiran Nagarkar opens his essay, Aloneness of Being Palestine, in the newspaper, The Indian Express, with a disclaimer, which reads as follows. Perhaps at the outset, I should make it clear that I am a quarter Jewish. As such, I feel I owe it to my Jewish grandmother to uphold the highest ethical standards when it comes to Israel or any other country, including my motherland, India. If you see that as an act of a turncoat, then you will also have to condemn some of the finest rabbis in the US and all over the world for being loyal to moral values and not to nationalism or my country right or wrong as many of the Indian political leaders have been insisting on. Unquote. As his essay progresses, he mentions how the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu reminds him of Adolf Hitler. He writes, he is blood brother, perhaps the unrecognized identical twin of Hitler. At least in one respect, they shared the, they shared the same objective. Come what may, get rid of an entire people. If one reads Vapa Purandri on Hitler and India, one realizes that Gandhiji was totally out of his depth when it came to understanding Hitler. He failed to grasp the sheer depth and magnitude of the evil that Hitler stood for. The same must be said about most folks who have been watching the Israeli Prime Minister. He goes on to write, while the Führer promoted the bogus doctrine of the Aryan super race, Netanyahu has never had any qualms insisting that the Jews have been the sole inhabitants of the land called Israel for the last 3000 years, and that Palestinians are the illegitimate occupiers. The only difference between the two unlikely twins is that while Führer planned the Holocaust on the quiet at the Wannsee conference and executed it in various concentration camps, with such finesse over several years that few Germans and outsiders knew about it. The Israeli Prime Minister does it in the full glare of the media machine, claiming that he and his people are the victims of non-stop violent Palestinian attacks. It is incomprehensible how a people who had suffered the Holocaust, which included Horrendous starvation, degradation and displacement and took the lives of six million Jews have been so relentlessly wiping out the very people who should have been their fellow citizens and partners. The Indian Express which published Nagarkar's essay is a centrist newspaper. Like Nagarkar, Kamal Mitra Chanoy also feels the need to divulge his personal Jewish connection as he questions the rationale behind the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit to Israel in his essay titled Modi in Israel. I am aghast as an Indian, ashamed as a secular Jew. Published in the news magazine Daily O. Unlike Nagarkar, he discloses it at the very end of his op-ed <coughs> by closing it with the words, as a secular Jew, I am deeply ashamed. He, uh, he calls Israel brutal and criminal and a racist and imperial country. He seems to draw inspiration from Noam Chomsky, Richard Fogg, Ilan Pape, about whom he admiringly mentions, reject the Zionist and racist creation of Israel. Chenoy is a professor at the Center for Comparative Politics and Theory at the School of International Relations, International Studies at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. His mother, Hanna Sain, was born to a Baghdadi Jewish woman from Kolkata, Simcha Gubey, and a Hindu convert to Judaism, Pyare Mohan Guha, a prominent lawyer.
Shanoi's essay was republished by the Communist Party of India, Marxist-Leninist, on its official website. In 2016, uh, Indian news magazine, Caravan, published an essay titled, Why Today's Israel Reminds Me of Nazi Germany, written by Yuri Avneri, an Israeli politician, journalist, and author. In it, he draws parallels between the treatment of Palestinians in Israel and that of the Jews in the first phase of Nazi Germany. He talks of resemblance between Israeli laws and Nazi laws and calls the Gaza Strip a huge ghetto. <coughs> Columnist Arsha Zahid does the same in her article titled A Holocaust to Create Israel and Another to Achieve <coughs> Greater Israel, which appeared in the Pakistani newspaper Daily Times. She equates the requirement that the Palestinians carry their identity cards with how the Nazis compelled the Jews to wear the yellow star of David. She even accuses Israel of forcibly injecting Palestinian women for the purpose of preventing them from giving birth. And this is a quote from her on the screen. This is just one little example of the anti-Zionist propaganda that Pakistan's 945 newspapers, with the exception of perhaps a few, indulge in. A fine specimen of the anti-Zionist rhetoric found in the Bangladeshi press is an article entitled Israel's Abdication of Moral Decency, written by a Palestinian freelance journalist, Fawaz Turki. It appeared in the daily newspaper Bangladesh Post in 2018. Since I'm running out of time, I wouldn't read out the quotation from him. I would rather move on to the remedial measures that I would like to suggest and propose. Uh, in, uh, yes, as far as the remedial measures are concerned, in March 2019, a delegation of 13 journalists from India visited Israel at the invitation of Israel's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The delegation included journalists from leading English language newspapers in India, such as the Indian Express mentioned above, and the Times of India, prominent news magazines such as The Week, among others. Among several speakers, the delegation was addressed by David Gorevich, a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of General History at Bar Ilan University. He informed me that most of the questions he was asked touched upon the definition of anti Semitism. Many wondered why certain ways of speech were considered as anti Semitism, while if one talked about non Jewish people in a similar manner, it would not be seen as racism. The world's oldest and the biggest. Jewish advocacy organization, the, or perhaps one of them, the American Jewish Committee, which maintains an office in India, has never published anything as a rebuttal to anti-Semitism or anti-Zionism in the Indian press. Their opets in the Indian press have focused on Indo-Israeli relations. The American Jewish Committee's Asia-Pacific Institute has collaborated with the Indian Pluralism Foundation an NGO headed by a Muslim, who is Aslam, for several events in Kolkata. Aslam, who claims that his maternal grandmother was Jewish, published an essay in a book brought out by the Muslim magazine, The Milli Gazette, in 2016. In his essay titled, Block It, of Ghazai Strip, Crime Against Humanity, Aslam writes, after more than 2,000 years of living in oblivion as vagabonds, these Jews, were overwhelmingly rapturous on the, on the accomplishment of declaring the state of Israel, redefining their identity as a national group and not just as a religious group. The birth of Israel came at the cost of Palestinian blood and treasure at a very prodigious price. He makes a plethora of allegations against Israel and goes on to equate Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, with the terrorist al-Baghdadi of the Islamic State. I do not know if Aslam still has the same view of Israel and its Prime Minister, while he collaborates with the American Jewish Committee in organizing panel discussions between Jews and Muslims, and in commemorating the United Nations International Holocaust Remembrance Day in Kolkata. When he published the essay, he had not collaborated with the American Jewish Committee until then. It certainly is an accomplishment if the American Jewish Committee has been able to convince him to abandon his anti-Zionism. 
but if it is not so, then the organization should definitely be more careful with the background check of the people it works with. The only way to eliminate anti-Semitism is through the spread of education. It reminds me of Robert Wistrich who said, the ignorance about Judaism and Jewish history is, of course, a particularly fertile breeding ground for anti-Semitism. I have a few chapters just to give you an idea of the hysterical level of the ignorance of Holocaust that is there in South Asia and also a few proposals, suggestions for remedial measures, but I am afraid I have run out of time. But I would just move on to the slide that has some of those remedial measures, even if I do not read them out.